Hello everyone. Um, thank you so much, George, for the kind introduction. Thank you to Jonathan uh, and to Michael and uh, the Porch team uh, more broadly for supporting this event, um, but also for helping me to realize other other projects. Um, so, in 1989, Austrian art historian Hans Bissans noted in a catalogue about the work of the painter Hans Lavin that um, he had the special gift of capturing the sad beauty of human subcultures. During his lifetime, Lavin, born in Vienna in 1873, was a popular genre painter who made his name with compositions about life in the Viennese suburbs and Austria's social peripheries, as well as allegoric scenes of war while serving at the Condition Front during the First World War. The artist's preference for social margins also had a strong ethnic angle. Letters from the late 1910s, for example, give evidence of many requests by female clients ordering so-called gypsy paintings. And indeed, by the 1920s, images of Roma figures had become Lavin's trademark. They widely circulated in the popular press, on postcards and in illustrated magazines, including works such as The Beautiful Gypsy, published in the illustrated humorous magazine Die Muskete in September 1935. The work is strikingly realistic, showing a, a young Roma girl standing upright in a richly embroidered dress with braided hair and delicate necklaces and rings, avoiding the viewer's gaze. Overall, she is framed as a human type, confirmed by the short description accompanying the image, noting a type which the painter Hans Lavin has internalized in many of his works. Dry as the description is, it is equally disturbing. Quite clearly, the painting shows a young girl, um, still with childlike features, yet the description the beautiful gypsy seems to refer to a woman. Indeed, looking at the wider presentation of the image within the page design, the girl's gaze is directed at an erotic cartoon to the right of the image, in which a semi-dressed woman jokes about the fast advances of her lover. Even though the, picture, the pictures bear no direct relation to each other, the positioning of the image draws a connection guided by the Roma girl's gaze. And in fact, exotic and eroticizing images of Roma women were a recurring feature in Lavin's work, including breastfeeding mothers whom lie sprawled out in the hay in ecstasy, resembling more an erotic display um, rather than a nurturing figure. At this point, you may wonder what Lavin's Roma paintings have to do with the conference theme. As a basic starting point, and this is very much where my research is at the moment, um, I would like to position Lavin's work as an example for the ways in which images of non-white communities circulated in Central European popular visual culture in the first decades of the 20th century. Rather than singling out the implications of Lavin's work per se, it serves to show how encounters uh, with the indigenous Americas were translated into Austrian visual culture, culture as part of a wider popular landscape. Implicitly or explicitly, intentionally or unintentionally, this forged parallels between non-white communities living in the Americas and those in Central Europe in visual culture specifically. Lavin's position as a so-called gypsy painter and genre artist thus serves as a pretext to exploring the free application of the term Indians in Habsburg and post Habsburg visual culture as it moved between ethnographic studies and great genre images. Beyond the popular Volker show, Schauen, Volker Schauen, that were organized in Vienna since the 1870s um, and which we've already heard about, um, these popular images can be read as a continuous visual affirmation of superiority circulating in such a way that they required a relatively low level of engagement, were widely accessible and showed strong continuity in their formulaic depictions of, from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century. Significantly, textual reports and discussions about both Roma and Native American communities had little impact on these depictions and differed quite strongly. By contrast, visual images are penned an easily comprehensible fantasy world uh, which functioned in an easily accessible sphere of entertainment that consistently affirmed a differentiation between Western modernity and peoples who seemed to live outside it, both at home and abroad. 
1922, Lavin moved to the United States, where he opened Hans Lavin School of Painting at the Palette and Chisel Club in Chicago, which he operated until 1924. He also exhibited at the Chicago Art Institute, as well as in Memphis and Milwaukee, and his paintings of precarity um, of post-war or in post-war Austria were quickly positioned as a means of promoting a pro-Austrian mood um, in, a, in the American and the exile press for um, exposing the inhumane uh, conditions brought upon by Versailles and Sacha Um This is a quote from the journalist E.M. Fortner. Lavin's painting sold at high prices in Chicago, fetching over $3,000 a piece and reaching, going by local newspaper reports, some of the highest prices ever achieved by resident artists in the area. So in other words, although he only spent a limited time in the US, Lavin had a successful stay which manifested his standing as a painter of social margins on both sides of the Atlantic. It is also at this point where portraits of Native Americans uh, seem to enter his over, such as uh, Indigenous Girl of the Americas. The portrait is a close-up image of a young girl looking at the viewer with large, shiny, dark eyes and a half-open mouth, her, exp her expression closely resembling that of the beautiful gypsy, which we saw earlier, even though she is portrayed from a different angle. Her dark hair appears to merge with the background and is held together by a metal glass. No name, no further details, not even a date. Given this lack of detail, leaving us with nothing but the artist's name and an anonymous indigenous girl uh, that is shown, the painting applies a familiar strategy from Lavin's earlier work, namely a typification which renders the sitter in a timeless space and removes any sense of individual identity. On the most basic level, this is a strategy of othering that particularly comes into play in the depiction of non-white others in Lavin's work. Their positioning in a non-place, especially in comparison to Lavin's quaint and recognizable Viennese suburb scenes, recall to Hannes Fabian's The Denial of Coevalness. Setting time types into a shapeless void, um, the girl appears to be positioned outside linear modern time and thus is positioned outside contemporary life. In fact, this is not Lavin's only portrait of this kind. The portrait of a Native American man shows a man with a red headscarf and long braided hair looking towards the viewer with a neutral face expression, I sucked him in. The background is left blank, uh, save for a white plane to accentuate the portrait, and the man, man's dress too appears unfinished like in a quick sketch. Even though the portrait is much lighter, therefore the concept of the portrait remains the same, showing a time in a no place. Yet, this portrait is interesting for other reasons too. Lavin's paintings of Native Americans seem to appear quite anomically in his oeuvre and often intermingle with his Roma paintings, which are a permanent feature of his work across the first three decades of the 20th century. This points towards the conflation of uh, different non-white communities by the painter himself, who would otherwise give more detailed descriptions to his ethnographic images. Curiously too, portrait of a Native American man has been dated to 1916, when Lavin was a war artist stationed in Galicia. Um, what is more is that the title of the image has been changed, initially referring to an Indian man, it appears to have posthumously changed to Native American. At first sight, this might not be surprising, However, it opens the question whether the so-called Indian in the image might not, in fact, represent the Rome. Lavin spent prolonged periods of time at an artist colony in Sornok, Hungary, uh, which was popular because of the nearby Roma settlement, who would model for artists in exchange for payment. Referring to Sornok in a letter to painter Albert Besnard, the Hungarian artist Lajos Kunfi, noted just a few decades earlier that, and I quote, there is no need to travel great distances as you can paint figures like that referring to Indians in Hungary. Thus one might put the somewhat ill-fitting date of portrait of a Native American man and its title down to a misunderstanding or a mistranslation. This would also fit uh, Lavin's painting practice. Correspondences indicate that the artist refused to paint 
types requested by clients if he was not in the position to paint from life a modern one occasion. At the same time, it is not wholly unlikely that Lavin met Native American people in Central Europe. As we've already heard yesterday, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, for example, stopped in Vienna more than once at the turn of the 20th century, accompanied by Native Americans such as Cuxa Q- Chief Flyerbach, for example. However, the point here is not to determine whether Lavin's study depicts a Native American man or a wrong. Rather, the point in case here is exactly the seemingly interchangeable position of the two in popular visual culture, regardless of fundamental geographic and cultural difference. Portrait of the Native American man, um, in this sense, points towards a practice of visual alignment for, for which Lavin's work is only one example. Picture postcards, photo essays, and illustrated reports in the Viennese press and that of other Habsburg successor states took a similar approach in depicting Roma and Native American communities, um, and um, including especially those from South American nations. Um, and they showed them as partially uh, nomadic tribes with close links to nature and with cultures underlying strict, uh, somewhat mysterious codes, seemingly impenetrable to outsiders. By and large, um, they both were also represented as groups threatened by modernity, forced to settle, to submit to the laws of majority society, to assimilate. Broadly speaking, the visual similarities indicated by Lavin and others of Roma and Native American cultures or peoples that thus find parallels in their positioning as non-white minorities looking back at a history in which Roma were uh, defined as European Indians or in the, in the sense of referring to Native Americans in the 19th century. In this sense too, the confusion evoked by the portraits provokes a conflation that builds on the romanticizing depiction of marginalized groups which is particularly apparent in popular visual imagery. Despite the visual similarities, there is a marked difference in the way American Indian and Roma communities are represented in the popular press, um, referring to texts, especially from the mid-1920s onwards. Reports of artists ethnographers such as Hans Sidonius Becker or Margarete Duvinage, for example, offer reports of different nations in Peru and Bolivia, in fashionable society magazines such as Die Bühne, often including portraits somewhat similar to Lavin's sketches alongside photographs. Meanwhile, um, the magazine, um, Die Bühne, um, and alongside progressive newspapers such as Neues Wiener Journal and Die Stunde, increasingly reported on the mistreatment of indigenous communities, one of the consequences of violence, illness, and civilizing missions on these communities, and trace how their lives were changing through the growing influence of European and white American culture. In this sense, photographs and ethnographic portraits uphold a static image, while the texts tend to emphasize a changing environment. As late as 1938, Die Bühne published caricatures joking about a white director's audacity to direct Indian dance practices. In other words, despite the limited range of visual depictions, the press addressed a variety of topics and took a sympathetic, even if strongly idealized point of view on different American Indian nations. This could not differ further from reports on Roma communities. Although quantitatively, um, reports on Roma and Native American communities are strikingly similar in the 1920s and 30s, which are no thanks to Anno, um, Roma feature in different media where reports are predominantly concerned with crime and cautionary tales. Positioned as um, a nomadic people one should avoid, in the Bühne, for example, reports and documentary features are overwhelmingly negative and strictly divide fictional representations in music and theatre from the real Roma living at the margins of society. Much like the reference to Wild West shows in relation to Native Americans, however, Roma communities frequently feature as, as entertainers performing their own gypsy identity as a means to make a living. Notably, too, is the separation of photographic and other artistic media. While they converge in reports on American Indians, reports on Roma either focus on documentary photography or they leave aside images altogether. At a time when the so called wandering gypsies law forced Roma communities to be fingerprinted and to carry with them special identity cards, popular texts 
thus reinforce a criminalizing um, ethnic stereotype far removed from the timeless gypsy images by, lar by Larvin. In the sense, the conflation of Indians in the work of Larvin and others points towards a discrepancy between text and image representation, bound by geographic proximity and a fascination for non-European others. Even though artists such as Larvin constructed a similar visual outline of both groups, they were employed wholly different in popular circulation. This brings the position of the artist himself into question, into the equation. Mike Sell has argued that, that modern artists uh, began to seek out Roma communities in the 19th century as an accessible exotic whose romanticization as nomads they sought to appropriate to position themselves as revolutionary outsiders. The German artist Otto Müller, for example, who published the so-called Gypsy album in 1928 and spent prolonged periods of time visiting Roma communities in Central and Eastern Europe, um, even claiming Gypsy heritage in an attempt of self exoticization um, which he also expressed through accessories such as ambulance. Müller, who was a member of the expressionist group Die Brücke in the 1910s, taught at the Academy of Applied Arts in Wrocław from 1919 onwards. Like Larvin, he frequently traveled around Eastern and Southeastern Europe, living with Roma communities. With reference to the depiction of Roma, the Central uh, European countryside was thus transformed into a semi-exotic yet accessible periphery of Wild West, which provided a sense of difference that was eagerly adopted in the drive for artistic innovation and emancipation. Yet emancipation exclusively referred to the reputation of the artists in question, rather than the communities they depicted. Ducking from this, the similar depiction of Roma and American Indians in Lavin's work makes sense as a feature of Central European culture, which seeks, which seeks to manifest its position within Western modernity, equating in visual terms types of non-white communities at home and abroad points towards the power structures embedded in visual materials specifically, which did little to differentiate otherness as a means to stress artistic exceptionalism more than anything else. What in this light can Lavitz's work tell us about Habsburg Austrian encounters with Native America in the visual arts, uh, or in the popular press more specifically? As someone who was neither part of a specific official mission, commissioned by someone for these portraits or notably engaged uh, with Native American communities during his time in the United States, Lavin may seem an odd case study here. However, it is precisely his rendering of seemingly exchangeable types of non-white marginal communities, be it the Roma or Native Americans, that make a point. On the one hand, these images show, an artist's show how artists position themselves as insiders of non-white communities to carve out a place for themselves in the competitive market. On the other hand, Lavin's similar treatment, both in terms um, of um, the typification and setting of Roman Native American subjects, indicate that for popular visual culture, no difference was made uh, between a fascination for the exotic near or far. Subsumed within similar stereotypes um, of what some might be termed uh, noble savages, disappearing communities and unrestrained lifestyles, Native Americans and Roma alike became a highly recognizable visual surface of projection, merging high in popular culture, ethnographic documentation and adventure stories. Indeed, while written material on both communities became a great deal more diversified during the 1920s and 30s, the visual stereotypes maintain the sense of continuity across time and across continents. Thank you.